are involved in the greatest war in the history of the world. Not everyone realizes that, but we are. It's a big war right now. It's not a war on terror, and it's not a war that has anything to do with bullets or bombs, aircraft, etc. It's actually much more serious than that. You see, this is the war for the eternal soul of each and every one of you. It's a war for the soul of anyone you've ever laid your eyes on. Anyone living today, anyone who will ever live in the future. And this is the war for their eternal soul. And at a foundational level, it is a war of worldviews, basically. The biblical worldview versus the secular worldview. And you see, the secular worldview is based on two religious beliefs. Yes, that's right. Secular worldview is based on two religious beliefs. First of all, millions of years of time. That's a belief leading to a Darwinian process. And that's another religious belief. And getting God out of the picture. Versus the biblical worldview, which is based on a perfect creation that was corrupted by man's sin, that separated us from our loving Creator, requiring our redemption with Him through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this. This is Karl Marx. He said, people without a heritage are easily persuaded. They're easily defeated because if you don't know what your nation's heritage is, you won't see any reason to stand up for it. He said that the first battlefield is the rewriting of a nation's history. And my friends, over the last 40 plus years, America's great Christian heritage has been pretty well erased in this country. Kids are taught now, and have been for 30 plus years, that Christianity had little to no role in the founding of this country. And that the biblical God had little to no role in the success this nation enjoyed for the first 200 years of its existence as a nation. How many of you have ever, ever been to Washington, D.C.? Yeah? I've been there four times, and I've been struck by what I've seen etched into marble, granite, and inscribed in brass while touring some of the great federal institutions there. Everywhere you find entire biblical verses and praises to our glorious biblical creator. And I have realized that our children are not being taught about this today. In fact, they are told quite the opposite. Our nation's heritage is being stolen from us. You know, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I have decided to pick up on this and spread the message about how our country's foundations are being destroyed. So over the next few minutes, I want to show you that America was founded by predominantly Christian men and women on primarily Christian principles. I want to show you that biblical creation is absolutely essential to America's freedoms. And I want you to see that to destroy the United States of America, all one needs to do is destroy the people's faith in biblical creation. In fact, Founding Father Jedediah Morse stated, Whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government must fall with them. And my friends, to destroy the pillars of Christianity, all you must do is destroy the people's faith in the early chapters of Genesis. 
And this is why we see creation under relentless attack in our society today. Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. Don't you think that what Moses wrote was important to Jesus? He referred to the writings of Moses many times. Because you see, Moses lays down the foundation for the gospel message in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. So let's talk about this briefly. This is where we're told God created a perfect universe. A perfect universe. Think about this. It was perfect. There was no death. There was no evil. There was no suffering. It was perfect. Well, what in the world happened to it? You know, one of the favorite questions that scoffers will ask a young Christian their first week in college to undermine their faith is, you believe in this loving, biblical God? Well, sure I do. But we live in a world full of death and disease and cancers, wars, car accidents and suffering. Come on, where is your loving God? There is no loving biblical God. So where's the biblical answer to that? Kids don't have that answer normally. Well, it's right there in the book of Genesis. What happened to the perfect creation? Well, here's the biblical response. Adam's original sin. You see, Adam's original sin brought on the curse, which allowed death and suffering to enter God's perfect creation. Original sin is very important from a Christian standpoint, because think about this. Adam walked in the garden with God. Adam's original sin separated man from our loving Creator. Requir requiring that we be redeemed and reunited with him. So the first promise of the coming Redeemer was given in Genesis 3.15. Think about this. By Genesis 3.15, this whole foundation is laid down with the first promise that God will send a redeeming Savior, where we're told the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. But wait a minute, what are we being told here? The seed comes from the man. So what are we being told? We're being told the coming Redeemer will be born of a virgin. And this is all laid down by Genesis 3.16. Most of the rest of Scripture is God's plan of salvation. Through the seed of the woman, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that sets the foundation for the gospel message. And that is why you see biblical creation under relentless assault. Now Moses also said that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills that were under the whole heaven. Ha! Huh. Come on, I mean, let's be honest here, you know. A global flood? <laughs> if there had really been a global flood, you know, I mean, what would you expect to find? The evidence would have to be overwhelming, wouldn't it? You know, if God's word were true, it would have to be obvious, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd expect to see the outer crust of the earth to be made up by sedimentary layers of rock that had been laid down by water, if there had really been a global flood. And I'd expect those layers laid down by water would be full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they wouldn't have time to rot away or be eaten by scavengers, right? So, what do we find today? Well, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. 
and they're full of billions of dead things that we call fossils. Exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true? And my friends, the Word of God is true, word for word and cover to cover. Jesus stated, But if you believe not Moses' writings, how should you believe my words? Jesus thought if you can't believe Moses, then you're going to have trouble believing him. Why? Well, the secular or humanist worldview has been taught in our public schools and colleges now for over 50 years, as if it were science. So think about this. The secular humanist worldview is based on the exact same sedimentary lay layers of rock laid down by water. You see, it's not like Darwinists have their evidence and Bible-believing creationists have our evidence. No, no, we have the exact same evidence. It's just a matter of which worldview you interpret the evidence through. And since the secularists have owned the schools now for a hundred years, they teach their religious belief as if it were science. I mean, based on the same evidence, they say, hey, wait, those sedimentary layers of rock didn't form in a flood. No, 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 those layers were laid down by water, formed over millions and billions of years of time. But they're full of dead things, those fossils. And that puts death before Adam. And that means Adam's sin didn't bring in death, didn't separate us from God, that there never was a loving creator. Death before Adam is what the modern old earth beliefs were designed to do, clearly. And if there was no separation from some supposed creator, then there's no need of redemption. And atheists have understood this perfectly well for a long time. Hear this from the American atheists in defense of public education. Destroy original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. They say, if Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And I pretty much have to agree with them on that. You know, we get a lot of weird emails from people, and here's one from a victim of rewritten history. He said, your attempt to convince others Darwinism isn't true is unconstitutional. You're a danger to society and should be in a mental institution before you take away the freedoms given to us by our forefathers. Well, you know, as silly as that sounds, it is almost what is being taught in public schools today. And if you're trying to stand up for creation these days, then you're trying to impose some kind of theocracy. But that's not true at all. So let's take a look at the fingerprint of God upon the history of the United States of America. Now believe it or not, in the early 1700s, before we officially became a nation, most of the people in the Christian church and the people of the land had actually walked away from the true biblical God. But they still held to a creation-based foundation. In other words, they still understood that a perfect creation had been corrupted by man's sin and separated them from God. So they still understood the need for a redeeming Savior. And when the Apostle Paul preached to people who understood the creation foundation, 
and were looking for a redeeming savior like the Jews, he just immediately preached that Jesus Christ is that Messiah you've been waiting for, who can reap a bountiful harvest and save souls. Well, in the 1700s, God sent over some British evangelists who teamed up with a handful of God-honoring pastors and they began teaching Jesus Christ died for your sins. And believe it or not, a lot of churches just slammed the doors right in their faces. So they went out to the open fields and meadows preaching Christ died for you and the crowds grew to the thousands. Churches returned to teaching Christ died for your sins. And we had the first great Christian awakening in this land, as all 13 colonies united as one nation under God, and demanded their God-given freedoms back from the British, which they had to win through the Revolutionary War. In fact, the Liberty Bell is inscribed with Leviticus 25.10, which reads, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Jesus said, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Well, the rock is the non-compromised word of God. Founding Father Benjamin Rush said, The only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion, and that Christianity is the only true and perfect religion. Speaking of our country's founding fathers, 93% of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Christians. 95% of the authors of the U.S. Constitution were Christians. This country was founded upon the rock. In fact, John Hancock, the first signer of the Declaration, said, It becomes us, as Christians, to reflect that without his whole blessing, the best human counsels are but foolishness. John Hancock, by the way, was the only signer of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. Nobody else signed it till August, a month later. He signed his death warrant and was just the only one for that long. Patrick Henry stated, This nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that clear enough? For everybody? <clears throat> the biblical belief is that God created man in his own image, male and female. Our founding fathers believed this as well. And in the Declaration of Independence, they wrote and committed to this phrase, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. But keep in mind now that kids in school are being taught that this country was founded by horrible bad people who were slave owners and this and that. Well, keep in mind that about that slavery issue that this country was founded at a time when the world was full of slavery. You couldn't just outlaw slavery, get 13 colonies to unite and take on the world's superpower in a war for their freedoms. 
But in the very declaration, they put down the biblically based principle that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The founding fathers believed our rights came from our biblical creator. And it was this phrase that was cited 75 years later and after tens of thousands of people gave their lives when we would finally, finally remove the yoke of slavery from this country. And this is the way to honor our country through its proper history. Yep, here's another email that we get. You won't get away with your Christian lies. The U.S. Constitution is a secular document. Well, let's see what the facts might say. Following the war, states failed to remain united. They began squabbling over trade rights and etc. So a constitutional convention was held in 1787. And at the convention, Benjamin Franklin proposed that each day should begin with a prayer to God. And since that time, every session of Congress has begun with a prayer to the biblical God. Until 2014, when a session was opened with prayer to the false God of Islam. George Washington is considered the father of our nation, the commander of the Continental Army, and he was the first U.S. president. He ended his oath for the presidency by saying, so help me God, as he bent down and kissed the Bible. Our second president, founding father John Adams said, our constitution was made for a moral and religious people it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Which might explain some of the problems we have today. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson attended church services in the U.S. Capitol and Supreme Court buildings. He wrote the education plan for the D.C. schools using the King James Bible as the primary reading book. Even though he had some different ideas on Christianity, it's clear that he wanted this country founded on Christian principles. But what about that constitutional separation of church and state? Well, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution is such a phrase mentioned. In fact, if anyone would have known about some such separation, it would have been James Madison, who is known as the father of the Bill of Rights. As president, he attended church in the U.S. Capitol building. He promoted the hiring of pastors for the House and the Senate, using federal funds to pay their salaries. In fact, the main reference source cited by the Constitution's authors themselves was the King James Bible. Now, this was never meant to be a theocracy, but they felt that Christian principles had to be there to provide for the morality needed for us to handle the freedoms that they were giving us. Believe it or not, though, by the late 1700s, Europe's age of reason invaded the United States. And this was a group of man-made philosophies that tried to answer all of life's questions and get God out of the picture. And it's sad to say the majority of Americans, and even the church itself, again, lost touch with the true biblical God. But they still held to that creation foundation. They still understood a perfect creation, corrupted by sin, had separated them from God, 
and they still understood the need for redemption. Many Christian schools like Harvard and Yale became secular, like many Christian schools have become today. But in 1795, Yale appointed Timothy Dwight to become their new president. And he began urging seniors to return to serving God with their lives. Lyman Beecher was a senior that year, and he became a pastor. And in the 1820s, Pastor Beecher began going out into public fields and town squares, preaching, Jesus Christ died for your sins. And crowds again grew to the hundreds and thousands. And churches again returned to preaching, Christ died for your sins. As we had the second great Christian awakening in this nation. In fact, they laid down the cornerstone for the Washington Monument in 1848. And inside of it were placed the Constitution, the Declaration, and the King James Bible. Christian engravings are, are found throughout that whole stone structure. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. The Capitol building was dedicated in 1858. Christian engravings are found throughout and all over its stone walls in letters 12 to 24 inches high. If you go into the house chamber, where the Congress meets. You walk in through the main doors, looking ahead to where the speaker sits. And up above the entrance door, which the speaker sits facing, are carved marble faces of history's 23 greatest lawmakers. And the very center face looks directly across toward the Speaker of the House. And that lawmaker is Moses. Some things that we don't hear about our nation's capital include huge paintings in the rotunda. For example, this one depicting the Christian baptism of Pocahontas. And the pilgrims praying for God's mercies before departing for the new world that would become the United States of America. And there's a rainbow in this picture too, symbolizing God's grace and protection. And a large stained glass window in the U.S. Capitol building's chapel depicts George Washington praying beneath the phrase, This Nation Under God. The Second Great Awakening led the crusade to abolish slavery in this country once and for all. In fact, the Battle Hymn of the Republic included the words, as Christ died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. And hundreds of thousands of Americans left their homes, their families and careers, where they died terrible deaths in the bloodiest war of this country's history, to free us all from the terrible yoke of slavery. Abraham Lincoln stated, the Bible is the best gift God has given men. We couldn't know right from wrong without it. Ulysses S. Grant, our 18th president, said, Hold fast to the Bible as the sheet anchor of your liberties. Well, the dedication ceremony for the Washington Monument occurred in 1884. Now, they had laid the cornerstone in 1848, and the delay for the finishing was due to the Civil War. And you can notice about one-third of the way up the monument, the rock changes color, because after the war they used a different colored stone. And that line of demarcation shows the time in history where this country finally lived up to our Founding Fathers' Christian-based belief 
that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And at the dedication ceremony, they put an aluminum cap at the very top of that monument, and they etched in on the east-facing side the Latin words, Laus Deo. So 555 feet above Washington, D.C., the country's capital, facing east are the words Laus Deo. It's the first thing lit by the rays of the sun in Washington, D.C. every day, and it has been since 1884. And those words translate, Praise be to God. I don't think they teach that in school too often anymore, do they? And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The building holding the Supreme Court was dedicated in 1935. Above the eastern pediment there are statues of history's greatest lawmakers, with Moses seated in the center holding the Ten Commandments. In a 1941 national radio address, FDR, Roosevelt, said, The Nazis are as ruthless as the communists in their denial of God, and that the coming war would be between human slavery and human freedom, and America would side with human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. My friends, never in the history of the world has a nation enjoyed the freedoms that we have enjoyed for the past 200 plus years. In 1950, Harry Truman said, the fundamental basis of this nation's law was given to Moses on the mount. If we don't have the proper fundamental moral background, we will finally end up with a totalitarian government. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower said, The real fire within the builders of America was faith in themselves as children of God. The Bible says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. At his inaugural ceremony in 1961, John F. Kennedy said, The rights of man come not from the generosity of the state. They come from the hand of God. My friends, your freedoms as Americans come from the fact that you are endowed by your biblical creator. And how long ago was that? And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And for the first 200 years of our existence, we were a blessed nation. We were never a perfect nation, not for an instant, though. I mean, we're made up of millions of sinful people, only saved by the grace of God. But we were a blessed nation, because as a whole, we were a God-honoring nation. Noah Webster was one of the nation's greatest Americans of all time, really. Definitely the greatest educator. And he wrote the first American Dictionary and the Blueback Speller which were used to train up Americans' children for the first 150 years of our existence as a nation. When, under this man's tutelage, we rose to be the greatest nation on earth. And Webster stated, the Christian religion is one of the first things in which all children ought to be instructed. 
Well, is this what we've been doing for the past 50 years? We've been doing almost exactly the opposite, right? What happened? Well, it really all started about 200 years ago when some secular scientists, some Christians as well, began reinterpreting those layers of sedimentary rock that were laid down by water. But back in those days, almost everybody thought we'd been judged by a global flood that laid down those layers of rock. But they started reinterpreting those strata layers, saying, hey, wait a minute, those layers didn't form in a flood. They formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time. And we get into this in more detail in the next couple of talks. Well, this opened the door for Darwin's book, which was published about 50 years later in 1859, about the time the old Earth beliefs began becoming popular, about 150 years ago. So Darwinism is a fruit growing off of old Earth beliefs. About 10 years after Darwin's book came out, Harvard appointed Charles Eliot to be their new president. He appointed Christopher Langdell to be the dean of Harvard Law School. And these gentlemen had one thing in common. They dedicated their lives to making millions and billions of years, leading to Darwinism, the new foundation for America's education systems and legal system. In fact, it was Landell who introduced case law study into the court system. Our courts are no longer based on the never-changing Ten Commandments. No, now it's all case law study. The law evolves case by case. Do you ever wonder why one guy commits a crime and gets two years in jail? while another guy commits the exact same crime and gets 20 years in jail. Another guy might commit the same crime and get off scot-free. It's because there's no foundation. The law evolves case by case through case law study. And it wasn't until 1947 that the Supreme Court discovered a separation of church and state in the First Amendment. Now, believe it or not, this was while finding in favor of using federal funds to support religious school activities. What in the world happened? Well, in the next few years, by 1962, the law had evolved and the court used the same finding to outlaw prayer in public schools. This is a year, to keep in mind, 1963, 53 years ago. Our nation officially turned their back on God. We kicked, or allowed to be removed, creation and prayer from our schools and replace those biblically-based teachings with the foundations of secular humanism. Millions of years leading to Darwinism. And for over 50 years, we've been teaching America's youngest citizens that they evolved without God. Everyone under the age of 70 now, basically, has been taught this. Now, there are many good and godly teachers I know in the public schools, and believe me, we need every one of them that we can get. They're practically missionaries now. But it's the curriculum that's corrupted. And the curriculum is pushing the secular foundations. Kids are being taught it's a fact, and they're being taught our rewritten history. They're being taught that it's a fact 
that life on Earth has evolved. It's a fact. Here's another email we received. It said, you make Americans stupid by convincing weak-minded people your invisible God created the world. Face it, Darwinism is a proven fact. It's a proven fact, except for the fact that there's never been found a single shred of evidence that it actually took place. The Bible talks about this. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It doesn't mean you're stupid. We can all be fools. I know brilliant people who believe in millions of years leading to Darwinism. They've just been fooled. And they change the glory of the incorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, changed his glory into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now these verses are talking about idolatry. And the highest form of idolatry is to think that you are the most evolved, that you are your own God. And that's led to so much evil in this world over the last 150 years. In fact, I'm working on another teaching, which will be the fifth one in this series, on the evil fruits of millions of years leading to Darwinism. And we have a teaching where I show you fraud after fraud after fraud right out of the high school and college textbooks where we totally destroy the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution. Have you ever heard that you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Yeah, they like to throw that one out there, don't they? Well, real science, a believer's best friend, now has that similarity down to 80% in some studies, but they still claim 98 to 99%. It isn't true. You see, the real science is not on their side, but they own the system. In fact, your biochemistry is 96% the same as that of a mouse, 75% the same as some worms. Your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana. <laughs> we have the same designer. So with no evidence to show anybody, how do they fool people into believing in Darwinism? Well, besides all the frauds, they say it all depended on an immense length of time. Time is the foundation. It's their magic ingredient. See, think about this. Billions of years of time set the foundation for Darwinism. And these two combined have given the foundation for modern naturalism and secular humanism. And if they lose millions of years, they lose it all. It's really important to them. It's their religious belief. See, we can go to any college now and talk about Darwinism, and they get mad. It's what everything they're doing now is based upon. If I go and talk about the age of the earth, I practically need bodyguards now. Seriously. They know the foundational issues here, and we also have a teaching about that, which I'll be doing next week, about the age of the earth. It's important. It's very foundational. And the global flood of Noah's time is the linchpin, because old earth beliefs put death before Adam. 
and they undermine that man's original sin brought death into the world, separated us from God, requiring Jesus' death on the cross to redeem us. And today, 85% of Christian children are leaving the church by the age of 20. That's 17 out of every 20 Christian children leave the church by the age of 20 because they're going through 16 years of schooling telling them that they evolved without God. See, my friends, we need to get involved with this. That's why I'm doing this. We need to get this information out. We need to contend for the faith. It's no wonder the Bible says, teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Did you know the Bible says, don't give heed to endless genealogies? like millions and billions of years. So I cover the age of the earth, the isotope dating methods, and how they actually just pick a date from the man-made geologic column or time scale. That time scale is just a belief that the layers form slowly. And the geologic column doesn't actually appear anywhere in the real world only in textbooks and museums. And it's important to understand that because it means if there were a global flood that explains how geologic layers form quickly, it wipes out every old earth belief. Here's another email that came in from another victim. It says, you're an anti-American communist using religion to take away our freedoms. You are despicable. I remember seeing that and thinking, who sent this one in? Daffy Duck? I was going to say, Sylvester the Cat. You are despicable. <laughs> you have to have some fun with this so you go crazy. Oh, my friends, etched into stone also in the Jefferson Memorial, which may be the most beautiful and best memorial there, is this quote. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Who gave us liberty? God. If you're standing up for the Christian faith, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you are contending for the faith, then you are protecting our freedoms, not taking them away. Communist dictator Mao Zedong killed 60 million of his own people in China just over 50 years ago. He listed Charles Darwin as his favorite author. Darwin provided the philosophical foundation for communism by supposedly getting God out of people's minds. When Roger Baldwin founded the ACLU, he shared an office with the largest communist newspaper in America called the Masses Newspaper in New York City. He said communism is their goal. Jesus said, Everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and it fell and great was the fall of the house built on the ever-shifting sands of man's ever-changing opinion. And the ACLU, which has communism as its goal, is responsible for bringing lawsuits that have banned Christmas displays and the Ten Commandments from public schools, the ACLU. We dedicated the Vietnam Memorial in 1982. 
it does not contain a single reference to God. And the ACLU that promotes communism brought lawsuits banning moments of silence and religious invocations from public schools. We dedicated the FDR Memorial in 1997 and it does not contain a single reference to God, even though he was quite a believer. During World War II, our government issued more than 17 million Bibles to military personnel around the globe. The World War II Memorial was dedicated in 2004. It does not contain a single reference to God. There was a plaque in the Washington Monument talking about that aluminum cap up on the top, which was inscribed with the Latin phrase, Laus Deo, praise be to God. Five years ago, the information about Laus Deo was removed from that plaque. Ronald Reagan said, without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. See, the American people today, and even a lot of churches, have lost touch with the true biblical God. I often hear pastors say things like, we don't bother talking about the book of Genesis. It's a non-essential. Non-essential? It is the foundation for everything. That's why I harp on it so much. The fact of the matter is that the nation and a lot of the church no longer hold to a biblical worldview. We are now a secular-based society. But then what do you expect? We've been teaching most of our citizens for over 50 years that they evolved without God, right? What do you expect? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? America needs another great Christian revival. The fact of the matter is that the church needs another great awakening. When the Apostle Paul preached to the people who did not hold to a creation foundation, they didn't understand the creation, corruption, separation, and the need for redemption with the Creator, like the Greeks, who had an evolutionary-based foundation, he said, Preaching Christ crucified to people who don't understand creation and the need for redemption is foolishness to them. So you tell someone who believes they evolved over millions of years of time that they need to repent so that they can be redeemed by their, with their creator and they don't believe there is a creator it's like preaching Christ crucified to the Greeks. So Paul regrouped, and he found an altar with an inscription to the unknown God, and he told them about creation. He taught them about the God of creation. He built the foundation, and then he planted the seed. So why the Bible? People ask me, why do you believe the Bible? Well, I heard this and I wrote it down because it exactly fits. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and they claim to be divine rather than human in origin. So I choose to believe the Bible. 
And here's some great news, though. Despite over 50 years of teaching kids, they evolved without God. Recent studies say, and think about this, 7 out of 10 U.S. adults, 70%, want to believe in biblical creation. They want to. They don't because they think that evolution and millions of years is science. They want to believe. They just need to get this type of information. That's how we can make a difference. See, God has done this before. He has brought this nation back before. And a lot of people now, I know, want to just give up. But don't give up. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, give up. <laughs> it says, contend for the faith. It says, spread the word. So we need to get out and contend for the faith. Because God can do anything. He's brought us back twice before. And if he wants to, he'll do it again. And he can use this type of information to do it. We share an important teaching on the age of the earth, as I said, and uh, call it an old earth or global flood, one or the other, and talk on that next week. We also talk about the dinosaurs and how they fit in with Noah's Ark and the age of the earth. Perhaps our most important teaching is science versus Darwinism. Because people need to hear this information, we have to present it to them. And I also speak on the evil fruit of evolutionism and old earth beliefs, what that causes. And working on a teaching also about astronomy and God, which is going to be really cool too. So I'll end with this. It was given to the ancient Israelites, but I think it's still the best shot that we've got today from Second Chronicles. God says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Because if America's Christians continue down the road we've been on much further, we're going to lose our God-given freedoms. And the world is going to lose what God had used as a city upon a hill for the first 200 years of our existence as a nation. In the name of Christ our Creator, Amen. Amen.